She left her job at McDonald's in Temple Hills, Maryland, came through here and disappeared. Didn't pick up her paycheck last Thursday. Didn't come home to see about her daughter, family members said. Three years ago, Letitia Frazier disappeared. Now the only person to go on trial for her murder received a sentence. Frazier was killed by a group of people, but her body was never recovered. I stomped her out. And then when I saw her stomping her out, they pulled me away from her. You know, we had to keep out, keep going on for her. You know, we couldn't just let her spirit die because she's not here to speak out to what happened to her. So we had to be that unspoken voice for her. On August 2nd, 2010, a responsible teenager, Letitia Frazier, ended her shift from her McDonald's job and got on the bus to go home. When Letitia got off that bus, she was never seen again. The authorities searched everywhere for her in the following months, but couldn't find her. But a year later, an anonymous phone call set investigators on the track to learning how a dispute between Letitia and the people she thought to be her friends led to her disappearance. Did Letitia know hanging out with her friends would cost her her life? Why did did her so-called friends decide to end her life? Let's find out in the story of Letitia Frazier, the teenager who was tortured, killed, and thrown in a dumpster by her 16-year-old friends. Now, like I said, it's just a nightmare you just can't wake up from. August 2, 2010, began like any day for Letitia Frazier. She got up, got her daughter ready for, for the day, then got ready herself. She made breakfast for the both of them, and they got out of the house. Letitia would usually drop her daughter off at her mom's before proceeding to work herself. Letitia's life was very small and happy. She was only 18 years old, yet she'd be through stead into the kind of responsibility that most older adults struggle with, but Letitia handled it with grace. When she found out she was pregnant, she knew she would do anything to be the best mom she could be to her little girl, but she also didn't want it to be the end of her life. She had big dreams, you see, and her daughter's birth was more motivation for her to achieve those dreams, not just to be able to make a good living to cater for herself and her daughter, but to set a great example for her daughter. Letitia had lived in Washington, D.C. her whole life. She was born there, and that's where she chose to start her life. It was all she knew. Before she got pregnant, Letitia lived with her family. They were all very close, and they fondly called Letitia, who, growing up, Letitia was a tomboy. She was very outdoorsy. While other girls her age were hosting tea parties and playing with their dolls, Letitia was outside playing sports with the boys. When Letitia entered high school, she still retained bits of her tomboyishness, but she was slowly becoming more feminine. It was obvious she loved school, and being a teen, mom didn't stop her from graduating high school. After high school, Letitia decided against going to college, rather preferring to pursue her dreams of becoming a chef. Other than her daughter, food was a close second. When she turned 18, Letitia enrolled in culinary school, moved out of her parents' house, and got a job at McDonald's. Despite not living with her family anymore, Letitia spoke to them every day. She was very close to them, so they usually know what her schedule was. When she had spare time, she would chose to spend it with her mom or her dad, who was an ice cream truck driver. She would follow him around his roots and helped him out while they talked. Letitia's life was far from perfect, but according to her parents, she was living the life she wanted. She had a happy daughter, a job that could provide for them both, and she had someone in her life she was seeing. Letitia was content, but all of that would take a turn for worse on August 2nd, 2010. On August 2nd, Letitia went to work after dropping off her daughter. After her shift was over, she went to the bus stop to wait for her bus home. Soon enough, her bus came and she got on it, but unfortunately, when Letitia got off that bus, she vanished. When Letitia never showed up to pick her daughter up, her parents were immediately worried. They tried calling her, but it kept going to voicemail, they knew something was terribly wrong. Letitia was a responsible and reliable person who always showed up when she said she would. When they couldn't reach her by call, Letitia's mom and her sister sent her a message on Facebook. Their hope was that her phone had no call service or something, but maybe she could respond on Facebook, but she never did. By the next day, August 3rd, Letitia still hadn't showed up, and her family were beyond worried. They knew something had to have happened to her. Letitia would never vanish and leave her child behind. That's just not the kind of person she was. She was a good mom who was 100% committed to her daughter. August 4th rolled around. It had now been two days since Letitia's family saw her, and at this point, they had no choice but to report her disappearance to the authorities. Letitia's family went to the authorities and reported her missing. They made sure to clarify that this was not the usual case of a runaway teenager, as Letitia would never do that. 
And that's what I feel, truthfully, that it's foul play, because that's not my daughter's character at all, to not get in touch with her mother, especially to talk to her child. Based on the information they received from her family, the investigators put in charge of the disappearance moved fast. They first went to her work to speak to her colleagues, who were technically the last people to see her alive. Letitia's colleagues at McDonald's spoke highly of her. They said she was a dedicated employee who never missed a day of work. She never had issues with anyone at work, and the customers loved her. They also told investigators that when Letitia clocked off from work that day, they had watched her get on the bus like she did every day. Nothing Letitia's co-workers said to the investigators stood out to them. It looked like she was a stickler for routine. She had had a good shift and gotten on the bus. They next person who might have seen her was the bus driver and whoever had been on that bus that day. But the investigators knew that was a long shot, as people might not remember her, but they thought to try anyway. The best way to figure out where Letitia went was to retrace her steps right to the point where she disappeared. It didn't take long for the investigators to find the bus she had gotten on that day, as that was usually the bus she got on every day at the same time. When they showed the driver Letitia's photo, thankfully he remembered her. He told the investigators she had gotten on the bus, but she was not alone. The driver told them she was with a young man, and that was not the first time he had seen her with that young man, as she usually rides the bus with him every day. The driver then gave the detectives accurate descriptions of the man in question and they were able to get a sketch artist to make a composite sketch from the descriptions. They showed the sketch to Letitia's parents who recognized him immediately. They told the investigators the young man was Letitia's boyfriend, and they often spent a lot of time together. As it was a fairly new relationship, the investigators wasted no time inviting Letitia's boyfriend in for questioning. They hoped he had gotten off the bus with her and would know where she went next. He confirmed he had been on the bus with her that day after she got off work but then Letitia had gotten off at a different bus stop than the one that would lead her to her mom's house. When asked why Letitia got off at a different bus stop, her boyfriend told the cops she had told him she was going to see a few friends before heading to her mom's house. He told them he stayed on the bus and got off at his regular stop and never saw her again. He said he expected her to call him when she got home like she usually did, but she never did. The cops were not so quick to believe him, though. It was normal in cases like this for the boyfriend of husband to be a person of interest. And the fact that he had been the last person to see her life made him less believable. But the good thing was, he had not been the only one on that bus, so the cops went to speak to other people who had been on that bus that day to corroborate Letitia's boyfriend's story, and fortunately for him, many of them remembered him. They confirmed Letitia had gotten off before him, and he had gotten off at his usual stop. His alibi also checked out so they were able to cross him off the suspect list. Before they left him, though, he told the investigators that he knew the friends Letitia said she was going to hang out with that day. They were her usual friend group, and she'd hung out with them multiple times before. When the investigators went to speak with the friends, they confirmed Letitia was supposed to meet with them on that day, but she never showed up. They told Invisictors they had tried reaching her and didn't get a response to. They had assumed she was too tired and chose to head home instead. For the first time in the investigation, the investigators had hit a dead end. Up until that point, they had always had a clue or lead to explore, but with the friends assuring them they had no idea where she would have gone. The investigation hit a wall. The question that racked the investigators was, if she never showed up where she said she would be and never went to her parents' house, where had she gone to when she got off the bus? The investigators decided T.I. restart the investigation, look at every clue they had with fresh eyes, and maybe they would see something they missed the first time around as people don't just vanish into thin air. While this was going on, Letitia's family decided to help the investigation by making missing person posters and pasting them all over the area she was last seen. Family members were back in this neighborhood again today, passing out flyers they had made up in search of 18-year-old Letitia Frazier, last seen by residents here last week. But that wasn't all they did. They also visited the neighborhood. She was supposed to have visited, and there they spoke to people around, desperately hoping they would find someone who would have seen her, and thankfully, they did. A few residents said they had seen her that day, but were not sure which house she had gone into. Last month. I see, and nobody's seen her since. Nope, I haven't seen her since. 
The search for Letitia had now been going on for some days now, and everyone was getting worried. The authorities had no clues or leads they could work on, and everything came to a dead end. It was so bad that they had no choice but to classify Letitia as a critical missing person and put all their resources into finding her. As we re-interviewed her and, and more information was obtained, we felt that it's more important to, to classify this as a critical missing person and to throw the resources of a critical missing person behind it. The local TV stations had also picked up Letitia's story with a camera team from ABC7 in DC following her family and friends around as they passed out flyers and spoke to neighbors. We've been out here each and almost every day passing flies at night, going up and down these streets, trying to find her daughter. But no matter how hard they searched, it didn't look like they would find anything. Letitia's family never gave up, though. They kept going back to the neighborhood where she was supposed to be meeting her friends and speaking to people. Finally, as they were about to give up, Letitia's family came across a woman who lived next door to Letitia's friends, and she claimed to have seen Letitia at that house. But when they interviewed the people in that house, a few of them said they didn't even know who Letitia was. One of them, 23-year-old Brian Grather, insisted he didn't know Letitia. I don't really know her like that. I don't. But the neighbor was very convinced she had seen Letitia at that house. While she wasn't sure if she had seen her on that very day, she did know she had seen her in that house a number of times. But Brian kept trying to convince them he barely knew her. He's trying to convince a neighbor who confronted him that he barely knew Letitia Frazier. But the neighbor wasn't buying it. At the time, she thought Letitia had run away from home and Brian and the others in the home were just hiding her. But back then, the neighbor thought the girl was a runaway and he was trying to hide her from her mother. The neighbor refused to accept Brian's statements. She knew she had seen Letitia there before a few times. So how was it possible that Brian didn't know her? <laughs> she didn't sleep with me. She might not sleep with you, but she didn't been in so it's not, it's not they, that but, you don't know but, who but she But at the same time, I like it from around here. I'll tell you, you know that. I don't really know a lot of people around here. When it looked like the neighbor wouldn't drop the issue, Brian offered to let Letitia's family search through the house. And when they did, they came up empty. Letitia wasn't there, and neither was anything that belonged to her. With Brian insisting that he didn't know Letitia that well and claiming she hadn't been there that day, in addition to the fact that nothing was found when they searched the house, the case had hit another dead end. The investigators spoke more with Letitia's friends and family, but they had nothing new to share. The leads had dried up and the case was quickly going cold. She left her job at McDonald's in Temple Hills, Maryland, came through here and disappeared. Didn't pick up her paycheck last Thursday. Didn't come home to see about her daughter, family members said. How is it possible that a young woman can step off a bus in a very crowded neighborhood and just vanish? That was the question that puzzled the investigators, and it didn't seem like they were going to get an answer soon. Letitia's 19th birthday rolled around and she was still missing. Her family celebrated by pasting more missing flyers of her all over town, still hoping she would be found alive. On January 13, 2011, five months after Letitia went missing, her family received a Facebook message that shocked them to their core. The message was sent from an account that was created with Letitia's middle name, Monique, and her last name, Frazier. At first, they thought it was Letitia, trying to let them know she was okay, but the messages soon took a threatening tone, and her family knew they weren't talking to their daughter. The person behind the account seemed to know something about what happened to Letitia, but instead of trying to help, they were trying to threaten her family, saying things like, one of them was next, and I'm watching you. The person also let her family know Letitia was gone forever, and they should stop putting up flyers as they would never find her. The messages were quite disturbing and bizarre, and left Letitia's family with a sinking feeling that their daughter wasn't just missing. She had been kidnapped and possibly unalieved. But why? Why would someone hurt Letitia like that, and why would they threaten her family? The answers to their questions was answered a few weeks later when the investigators caught a big break in the case. Letitia's family took the messages to the investigators. This was a new lead. They felt whoever was sending the messages likely had something to do with Letitia's disappearance and was just trying to derail the investigation. They quickly traced the IP address of the account sending the threats and soon found the address where the messages were been sent from. But unfortunately, when they went there, they discovered it was an empty lot. It was clear whoever was sending the message was trying trying hard to mask their identity and location. It made the investigators even more curious, but with no location and no new leads, they had nothing to work on, and the case was getting 
getting colder and colder by the day. But Letitia's family refused to give up. They believed their daughter was out there and they could find her. They continued to paste flyers all over town, talking to everyone they came across. They also pressured the investigators to explore more leads and TV stations into airing Letitia's story. Around this time, ABC 7 DC, which had been following Letitia's family about, released its documentary, and thankfully many people saw it and started sending in tips. A few of the tips were worth pursuing, and some of them weren't. But one of them, in particular, proved to be very informative for the investigators. Within hours of ABC 7 airing Letitia's story, a witness came forward with information. The witness who had seen Brian Geither on TV called the investigators to let them know he had information about Brian's involvement in Letitia's disappearance. The witness said Brian had bragged to them about taking someone's life, and when they asked him who he unalived and why, he told them he had unalived Letitia and that he had done it because she stole money from them. But that wasn't all, according to the witness. Brian described in detail how they went about ending Letitia's life, saying there were six of them that carried out the chilling act. Three boys and three girls. He said the women lured Letitia into the apartment and jumped her. Then the boys joined in, attacking her severely. Brian then told the witness that he was the one who finished Letitia off. At the time, the witness didn't believe Brian, thinking instead that he had made the whole thing off to seem scary. But when they saw Letitia's story on TV, a chill ran through their spines. They knew they had to tell someone. The very next day after the witness came forward, the investigators took him to the same house Letitia was supposed to have visited that day. There he identified one other woman who had been found at the apartment as one of the women involved in the attack. Her name, Cynthia Proctor. They took Cynthia down to the station for questioning and she had a lot to say. In fact, she told them everything. She told them some of the boys involved had approached her a few days before the tragedy. They told her they needed her to jump a girl who had stolen money from them, she agreed to. On August 2nd, she went over to the house as planned, and they carried out their sinister plan. She told the investigators they lured Letitia into the house and immediately began to hit her. Letitia tried to fight back, but it was three against one, and she soon gave up fighting. When the girls were done with them, the boys jumped in and added to Letitia's pain. They then taped a pillow over her mouth to keep her from screaming and locked her in the closet while they cleared off the crime scene. Synthus told the investigators that as they were cleaning up, one of the boys present told them Letitia had stopped breathing. She confessed she didn't know what happened to Letitia's body, as that had been the extent of her participation on that day. Before the end of that day, Brian Gaither was arrested. He also confessed easily to the investigator, saying he had joined in hitting her before putting her in a chokehold. But he said when he left her, she was still breathing, but others continued to strike her until she stopped breathing. He then said, they kept her body in the apartment before they dumped her in the apartment dumpster. He confessed that when he went back to look for her, she was no longer there, and neither were the previous content of the dumpster. Letitia Frazier was coming home from her job at McDonald's when lured into this apartment in Southeast and six of her so-called friends jumped her, beat and strangled her to death through her body in a dumpster. Brian's confession was like a domino effect, leading the other people present on that day to also confess. The next person to confess what they had put Letitia through was Lawrence Hassan, and he had a lot more to tell the investigators about why they carried out the horrific act. He corroborated what Cynthia had told the investigators, but then added that they hatched the plan when a member for their group, Johnny Sweet, had come to them to tell them someone had stolen $900 that belonged to him. Now, for some reason, even though there were many of them who frequented that house, Johnny suspected Letitia was the one who had taken his money. Because Johnny Sweet, now age 19, sentenced today, claimed she had stolen money from him. At that point, they came up with the plan to lure Letitia to the apartment to punish her. The moment she got to the apartment, they told her everyone was hanging out in the bedroom and she followed them, not knowing what waited for her behind those doors. Lawrence confessed they all jointly attacked her, and when she was within an inch of her life, they covered her face with a pillowcase and shoved her in the closet. They then went to hang out in the living room, but they could still hear Letitia moaning. So, according to Lawrence, Brian went back there to shut her up, and by the time her returned, Letitia had gone quiet. Brian had put her in a chokehold. They shoved her back in the closet and left the house to go see a movie, Lawrence said. They brutalized her and 25-year-old Brian Gaither finished her off with a chokehold. A few days after the first set of arrests, the investigators took Johnny Sweet into custody. Confronted with the confession of his accomplices, he didn't 
take long for him to confess too. From his confession, it was clear Johnny was really the leader of the whole thing. Everyone involved followed his orders. It was his money he claimed was stolen. He was the one who insisted Leticia had stolen his money. He was the one who put the sinister plan together. After speaking to all of the individuals involved and going over their confessions, the investigators had a full picture of what happened to Leticia on August 2nd. August 2nd, 2010, 16-year-old Johnny Sweet and others attacked and killed Leticia Frazier, an 18-year-old single mother. Johnny told the investigators a bit more about what happened. According to him, after they brutalized Leticia and shoved her in the closet, the girls gave the boys massages while they discussed what to do with Leticia as if it was just a regular day. He said after a few hours, they went back to the room to check on her, and that's when they found out she was no longer breathing. They didn't initially know what to do with her, so they left her in the closet for two days while they came up with different ways to dispose of her body without getting caught. For those two days, one of them slept in the same room Letitia's body was in, but that wasn't all he confessed. He told them that at first, they thought of dismembering her, but none of them could go through with it, so they placed her body in a large container and took her to the dumpster where they threw her in. After all this time looking for her, the people who had her had been right there, hiding in plain sight, even getting involved with the investigation as Brian did. After the confessions, cops went to the house where Letitia was unalived in, and there they found several pieces of evidence tying them to the murder. They found a red bodily fluids all over the carpet in the bedroom where Letitia was struck severely. They also found the same fluid in the closet where she had been placed after the attack. The evidence, in addition to all their confession, led the investigation to charge all six of them. Brian Guyther, who was the oldest among them at the time, was 23 years old. Lawrence Hassan was 22, followed by Cynthia Proctor, Liney Bell, and ringleader Johnny Sweet, who were both 17 years old. The youngest of them at the time, Annika Nelson, was 16 years old. All of them were jointly couraged with the murder of Letitia Frazier, though investigators had enough to charge them. They were still missing one important part of the investigation, Letitia's body. All six of them insisted they had put her body in a dumpster, and that meant her body was probably on a landfill, and it would be nearly impossible to find her. Today, Gaither admitted he threw Letitia Frazier's body in a dumpster. It was hauled to a landfill and not seen since. Usually, trying a murder case with no body is difficult, but in this case, everyone except Johnny Sweet pleaded guilty and took plea deals. The others involved already pleaded guilty and were sentenced to between 18 and 32 years. The other four were the first to plead guilty guilty, followed by Brian Gaither, who pleaded guilty the moment he discovered the court would not allow that ABC7 tape of him letting Letitia's mom search the house. A guilty plea from the man accused of killing teenager Letitia Frazier. The 18-year-old girl was beaten, her body tossed into a dumpster, and has never been found. We cannot say exactly what led to the guilty plea to first-degree felony murder, but prosecutors said they had planned to use ABC7 news clips against 25-year-old Brian Gaither, who could have faced up to 60 years had he gone to trial as scheduled next Monday. That tape would have been particularly damning because at that time, he knew he was letting Letitia's mom into the same house he unalived her daughter in. That was a different kind of cruelty. In sentencing today, Judge William Jackson spoke of Gaither's unspeakable cruelty, knowing he had already killed her and disposed of her body. Gaither put his arm around Frazier's mother, offered to let her search this apartment, where he now confesses he and five others attacked Frazier and choked her to death. Even though he had confessed to being a part of Letitia's murder, Johnny decided to take his chances in court. Johnny Sweets, the only remaining defendant, uh, allegedly started the whole thing when he said that somebody had stolen $900 from his apartment, decided that it was Letitia Frazier, and then sicked his friends on her. His trial is scheduled in April. The sentencing for Brian Gaither is set for February 1st here at D.C. Superior Court. But it didn't work out so well for him. His plan had been to leverage his terrible childhood in court to gain the judge's sympathy. But today, Sweet's attorney begged for mercy, saying that at age 12, he and his now deceased mother used to drink alcohol together. He did not have a good upbringing. But his attempt to gain sympathy and a lesser sentence failed. In April 2013, Johnny Sweet received a higher sentence than the rest of the defendants. But the judge gave little consideration to that and sentence the now 19-year-old to 52 years in prison. After his sentencing, Johnny gave a speech asking for forgiveness. After going to trial and losing, Johnny Sweet said today, I ain't gonna sugarcoat it. I had a part in it. A life was taken due to a careless decision. Hopefully someday y'all can forgive me. 
If y'all don't, I can understand. After three years, Letitia's family finally got justice for their daughter. Well, justice has been served, so I'm pretty good about that. Letitia Frazier had a daughter who's now five. My granddaughter, I wish she just, you know, could have her mother, but, you know, right now we satisfied with the justice with what happened today. We, I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied with it. But despite her, the people that took her life being cowed, Letitia's family has still been unable to get closure. This year marks 14 years since Letitia vanished, and her body has still not been found. And the possibility of finding her dwindles with every year that passes. They investigators never found any evidence that Letitia had stolen any money from Johnny Sweet. At the end, Letitia had lived a short life and suffered a terrible death. Hey, thanks for watching. Our heart goes out to the family and friends of Letitia Frazier. What are your thoughts on this case? Do you know of other similar cases? Let me know in a comment and before you go, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. See you next time and stay safe.